Not good. I'm not going to read that. I just recorded that. All right. So this chapter is the endocrine system. This system right here is a system that doesn't get a lot of attention. It's just your hormones. Super important. There's two uh, systems that, at the very beginning, I said, you know, th these two systems are responsible for communicating and controlling your body. It's the nervous system and the endocrine system. But no one ever pays attention to the endocrine system. And um, it's because they don't understand the, the mechanisms and the workings of it. So um, endocrinology is the study of the endocrine system. When we talk about endocrine, endocrine just means hormones. When we're referencing the endocrine system, we're talking about the hormones. So we'll look at endocrine organs today. And each of the endocrine organs creates, or creates and releases an endocrine hormone that is released. And it regulates some process in your body. So overall, what do hormones control in your body? Everything. Um, the only thing that they don't do is transmit electricity, and that's the responsibility of your nervous system. So nervous system uses electricity to communicate. The endocrine system uses hormones to communicate. So we use hormones for reproductive purposes. Now, of course, sexual reproduction is what comes to mind everybody's first, but mitosis, um, that is carried out by hormones. It tells us we need to grow, growth and development, maintenance of electrolytes, water, and so this is our uh, antidiuretic hormone. Regulation of cellular metabolism, this is the thymus and thyroid hormone. Not thymus, the thyroid hormone, sorry. And then the mobilization of body defenses. That is from your adrenal gland, that's epinephrine, fight or flight. Those are all hormonally regulated. Two types of glands, and I mentioned this in the previous lecture. Endocrine glands, endocrine glands are characterized by the fact that they release their product into your blood. So they don't have a specific destination. They just release into your blood. And anywhere your blood goes, that hormone goes. Exocrine glands have a specific duct. D-U-C-T. So they have a specific destination for their secretion. So exocrine has a specific destination. Endocrine is just released into your blood. So when we look at the endocrine organs, these are all releasing their product into your blood. Okay? So any type of hormone that's released will just get into your blood, and we'll talk about how we determine what it is that they react to. When we look at endocrine glands, this includes our pituitary gland, which is up here, thyroid, then parathyroid, so you have your thyroid gland, and then on the back of them you have parathyroid glands. You have your adrenal glands, which are on top of your kidneys, your penile gland also up here. Hypothalamus is not an, an endocrine gland, but we call it neuroendocrine. Neuroendocrine means that it's mixing the nervous system with the nervous system is being mixed with the Yeah, endocrine system. The answer is right there. It's right there. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have the pancreas. The pancreas is unique because it has both endocrine and exocrine functions. Endocrine hormones is going to be insulin, and exocrine is going to be digestive juices. So the pancreas releasing digestive juices. Gonads. Gonads are the ovaries and testes. So endocrine and exocrine there, and the placenta also. The placenta is a temporary organ that houses the baby during development in the uterus. There are other tissues in your body that produce hormones that are not part of specifically your endocrine system, okay? But they still have endocrine functions. So adipose, do you remember what adipose is? That's your fat, yeah. So fat tissue, the thymus, cells in the walls of your intestines. So we're going to call that the inter intro, intro integrin system. Your stomach, kidneys, and heart. And we're going to discuss all of these. So here would be the diagram if um, we were just going to diagram the, the, tissue, the endocrine glands, um, the organs of the endocrine system. This is what they would be. Pituitary and penile gland up there um, in, in the brain. Then you have your thyroid, parathyroid. Here we have our thymus. Then we have our adrenal glands, our pancreas, which is endocrine and exocrine, <coughs> ovaries if you're a female, and testes if you're a male. And hormones are chemical messengers. So... Again, two systems communicate in our body, the nervous system and the endocrine system. The nervous uses electricity. The endocrine system uses hormones, which means it uses chemicals to, to communicate. When we talk about those, different types of hormones, there's autocrines. autocrines. Autocrine hormones are, I am an organ, and the hormone I produce affects me. So I, like for example, the heart. 
the heart produces ANP, which is atrial natriuretic peptide. And that hormone impacts only the heart. So that's autocrine. Paracrine says, I am an organ or a gland that releases a hormone, but I re only impact areas around where I am located. So the small intestine, the enteroendocrine system, when it releases paracrines, it impacts that area only. So paracrine is in that area, autocrine is self-inflicting, and then endocrine is all in the blood. So wherever blood goes, that hormone goes. Um, so again, autocrines and paracrines are local chemical messengers. So they're acting directly within that area. They're not just released generally into the blood where everything is impacted as a result. There are two types of hormones, and we covered this in 01 as well, but there is amino acid based, and then there's steroid based. Amino acids are proteins. Steroids are fats. The difference is what they can impact. So you are, remember, just a big bag of cells, and your cells have that phospholipid bilayer. So two layers of fat. If your protein, when you try to go through fat, you cannot. So protein-based hormones cannot get into your cells. So the only way, if I am a hormone and I'm protein-based and I'm trying to communicate in this cell, I can't get through. I have to shout my message in. I cannot get into the cell because I'm protein-based. If I am a steroid, so I'm fat-based, fats like fats, so as soon as I get into contact, I can go straight in and impact that cell and make changes immediately. So whenever they say, oh, I'm gonna give you a steroid shot, the answer is it works faster because it goes straight through the cell membrane and can impact that cell directly, immediately, versus taking long course medications that are protein or amino acid based, it takes longer to get them to have an impact. So your hormones have two choices. If they're amino acid based, they can't get in the cell. If they're steroid based, they can get in the cell. And that's gonna go along for those of you who go into pharmacology when you look at different types of treatment and medications as well. Water soluble hormones, lipid soluble hormones. This is the exact same as what we just covered on this, this previous slide, but we're using different terms. Water soluble hormones are our protein based. When water tries to get into fat, what do water and fat do when they come into each other? into contact. They repel. So water soluble hormones aren't going to get in. So that's going to be protein based. Fat or lipid soluble hormones. Lipids are fats. So lipids can go straight through and impact. Okay. So these would be our steroid base. Okay. Again, cannot enter the cell, can enter the cell. And when you're looking at hormones, if it, if it tells you this is a lipid-soluble hormone, it can go through. If it says this is a water-soluble hormone, it cannot go through. If it's protein-based, cannot go through. If it's steroid, it can go through. So fats like fats, they don't like anything else. Anybody confused or need clarification there? Fantastic. So I mentioned previously, a few moments ago, that whenever you release a hormone, you release it into your blood. And it just carries anywhere that there's blood, that hormone goes. Here's the thing. If I'm growth hormone, what am I going to impact? Growth hormone. If you, and you can be wrong. It's, it's totally safe to be wrong. But just logically speaking, growth hormone, where are you going to see the most impact? What tissue? Bone. Bone? and muscle. Okay, so when I release growth hormone, it'll be released into my blood, and it will touch my skin. But does my skin react to it? No, it won't, because my skin does not have receptors for it. But my bone has receptors for it, and my muscle do as well, so as soon as the growth hormone comes into contact with them, the growth hormone, because the bone and muscle have receptors for it, they respond. I often use the example, like, when I'm teaching a topic, if you have a receptor for what I'm teaching, you're going to internalize it. You're going to learn it. And if you don't have a receptor for it, I'm still releasing it into the air, whether you're receiving it or not. It's just that you're not ready to receive it at that point. 
okay? So when you release hormones into your blood, it goes to everywhere the blood goes. But the only tissue that responds to it has to have a receptor, okay? So like insulin, your skin doesn't respond to insulin, even though insulin is released into your blood. So we'll talk about target cells or target tissue. It's a target tissue or target cell if it has a receptor for that hormone. So yes, tissues with receptors for that specific hormone. So not every tissue has a, a receptor for that hormone. It gives you an examples here. Um, ACTH is adrenal corticotropic hormone. And we're, we're going to come back to that. There's only a few that we're going to discuss. And I say a few, it's like 10. Um, they're only found in the adrenal cortex, the receptors for that. So even though I release ACTH into my blood, adrenal corticotropic hormone, it only impacts the cortex of my adrenal gland. So it's all over my blood, all over my body, but only when it gets to my adrenal cortex does it actually work. Okay, so that's what it's giving you the examples there. But when you talk about thyroid hormone, thyroid hormone is a metabolic hormone. And we talked about metabolism being anabolic and catabolic, like just the, the chemical activities that occur in a cell. Every single cell in your body has its own metabolism. So when you don't release thyroid hormone, it impacts the metabolism of all your cells. And vice versa, if you over-release thyroid hormone, it impacts because all of your cells have a metabolic function. Okay, so if it has a receptor, it'll respond to that hormone. And if it doesn't, it won't. What might a hormone cause a cell to do? A hormone might tell a cell, hey, it's time to grow. Or, hey, I need you to become more permeable. And what does permeable mean? Things can get in and out of it, okay? So I need you to allow things to come in, or I need you to not let anything in. So the impact of that hormone is going to be determined by the structure of that hormone. So you can't just say all hormones are going to speed things up, or all hormones are going to slow things down. The, the, the function of that hormone will be determined by its shape, and we learned that, of course, in 012. Shape determines function. Fantastic. Okay. So it mentions just a few things that that hormone may cause that, that cell or tissue to do, just for suggestive purposes. Whether, what, how much effect a hormone is going to have on something has three dependent factors. How much of that hormone has been released. If it's just a little bit of hormone, it's going to have a little bit of effect. If it's a lot of bit of hormone, it's going to have a lot of bit of effect. Okay, so the blood levels of that hormone. How many receptors are there? If there's a lot of receptors, we're going to see a big impact. If there's not a lot of receptors, we're going to see a small impact. And the affinity, how attractive is it? If it's really attractive, we're going to see a lot. And if it's not attractive, we're not going to see a lot. So these are the three things that depend, or are three factors that depend on what amount of impact the hormone will have. We call the affinity, we can reference it as upregulation or downregulation. When I talk about upregulation, I think of it being if you don't have a lot of money, you have an attraction to money, true or false. Like you're like, I need, I need to earn, I, I'm willing to work more. You have an upregulation. So I have more receptors to opportunities to earn money. So I can teach at all these different campuses. You know, I have four kids that all play, I need money to pay for all of that stuff. So I put myself out to where I can teach at all these different places. I have a high affinity for that. I have a lot of receptors for that. My kids, on the other hand, have a low affinity for money. And they have a low affinity for money because they don't need it. Why don't they need it? I give it to them, which I've screwed myself on. That's right? Okay, yeah, no. Um, I just, I don't get it. My daughter had a job for like three weeks. Mom, I got fired. Why did you get fired? I didn't go to work. How do you know you got fired? I text my boss and said, what do I need to do? She said, immediate termination. What does that mean, Mom? <laughs> I mean, you got fired. You're lazy. But my kids just, they are like, oh, well, mom's going to pay for it. I don't have to worry about it. And so they have a low affinity to it. So they have a low attraction to it. So what I need to do is take it away from them. And then perhaps it'll upregulate. We'll see. But anyway, affinity is your attraction to it. So me, I know that I need it, and I know that I need to get it taken care of. I'm upregulated. So there's a lot of receptors for it. Downregulation means you, you have it. You don't really need it. So if you have a lot of money, you don't really have the attraction to try to go get it. And if you have a lot of hormones, 
your body's not really looking for them because there's so many of them. Okay, and we're going to talk about different implications of those as we get into specific hormones. How do we know when a hormone will be released? <coughs> there are three triggers for hormonal release. Humoral stimuli. Do you remember what humor is again? Body fluid. So there's some type of fluid that is telling me, hey, you need to release this hormone. So humoral stimuli, neural stimuli. My nervous system is saying, I need to release these hormones. Or hormonal stimuli. Another hormone is saying, you need to release that hormone. Okay, so there's three things that can trigger the release of hormone. Either body fluids, the nervous system, or other hormones. And I just simplified them, but you need to know them by humoral stimuli, neural stimuli, and hormonal stimuli. And we're going to speak about each in detail, but just so that you know. For example, humoral stimuli, so body fluids. You have in your body tons, thousands, millions of chemoreceptors. Chemoreceptors, their job is to monitor the chemical composition of your body fluids. <clears throat> if one of your receptors says your calcium levels are low, so you have a chemoreceptor that says, hey, calcium levels are low. We know that muscle contraction is completely dependent on calcium. Neural stimulation is completely de de dependent on calcium. So when calcium levels are low, that's, that's a problem. So when we get that message, hey, calcium levels are low, that's a humoral message, and it tells our parathyroid glands to release parathyroid hormone, and parathyroid hormone will break down my bones, and we're going to go into each of these hormones, just so you know that. But parathyroid hormone will break down my bones and release calcium from my bones into my blood so that I have the calcium I need to carry out all the, the neural and muscular activity I need. That's humoral stimuli. So a chemoreceptor said, hey, you're low. We need to break down bone. And a, a hormone was released so that I could break down bone. So PTH, real quick. PTH is parathyroid hormone. Oh, it says that right. I just want to make sure that I've said that. Here is your thyroid gland. Thyroid is here. Parathyroid glands are on the posterior surface of it. So this is a dorsal view or the posterior view. My parathyroid or my thyroid gland, and then here are my parathyroid glands. You may have more than four, you may have less than four, but this is a textbook example. Okay. Neural stimuli. <coughs> I might, need, I might release hormone as a result of some type of neural stimulation. If my brain says, I need you to react to this, it's going to trigger an electronic response. So electricity is going to be sent to whatever gland it is, and I am immediately going to release that hormone. So if the nervous system tells me to release that hormone, I'm going to release that hormone. Let me give you an example. If we heard a gunshot right now, immediately our brain would send a message to our kidney, our adrenal gland, and we would release epinephrine instantaneously. And what would our heart rate do? It would increase. What would our respiratory rate do? Increase, okay? Our vessels would dilate, our bronchioles, bronchioles would dilate. All of that would happen instantaneously because a nerve, an electric response went down and said, this is what I need to do, and it, and it caused that. So it could be humoral, so chemoreceptors, or it could be from the nervous system, the nervous system saying, hey, I need you to release this. So th this is actually giving you the example I just gave you. If we heard something that scared us, or if we got excited, all of a sudden, it would immediately go to our adrenal gland, and we would release epinephrine, and it would have an instantaneous effect. Our heart rate, even if you were to think of something right now that scared you or made you really happy, you would, your heart rate would increase, your respiratory rate would increase. Just thinking of it, okay? And that's neural stimuli. The last one is hormonal stimuli. So if another hormone tells you, I need you to release this hormone, we have these hormones, and we're going to discuss them today. We have, like, <clears throat> adrenal corticotropic hormone, which was ACTH. I just spoke about it a moment ago. In order for ACTH to be released, we have to have cortical-releasing hormone released first. So we have to have a hormone... Tell another hormone, I, it's time for you to be released. We call those hormones either releasing hormones or inhibiting hormones. Do you recall what inhibiting means? It stops it. So let me give you growth hormone. If, if you're growing right now, 
it's because your brain has released GHRH, which is growth hormone releasing hormone. When you release that growth hormone releasing hormone, it says, hey, you can go ahead and release growth hormone. If you're not growing right now, it's releasing GHIH, which is growth hormone inhibiting hormone that's telling you to do what? To not to grow. Okay? And like when you hit growth spurts, like during puberty, we're releasing it in high amounts. And when we're not, we're releasing inhibiting so that we don't grow any further. This is showing you your hypothalamus because this is going to come into play. Your hypothalamus is where you're releasing and inhibiting hormones are stored and produced. So releasing and inhibiting hormones here. Here's your pituitary gland. We're going to have the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. We're going to talk about those briefly in just a little bit. And then here are the different impacts or effectors that would have the receptors for those individual hormones. So hormonal stimuli. Um, your, your hormones are going to be communicating. They're going to do whatever it is that your hormones do. But your hormones can immediately be trumped by your nervous system. Your nervous system can take over at any point. And because it is so powerful and immediate, its impact will trump anything that your endocrine system is doing. Okay? So if your endocrine system is working and functioning on this, da, 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 and your nervous system steps in and says, I need you to do this, guess what you're going to do? Whatever the nervous system says. So it mentions that the nervous system trumps this. It says, example, under severe stress, I don't even have to be scared. But like for my homies who've been hanging out with me in all summer one, your stress levels are higher. And how you cope with stress has been prevalent. Whether it's that you don't eat or you eat, your coping mechanism has been enhanced through the summer force because th that's how you handle stress. Even when your endocrine system says, hey, you're full, you're still stressed, so your stress response may be, I'm just going to eat, or I'm going to eat while I study so I don't fall asleep. Like, your nervous system is trumping whatever, whatever happened. You're not scared. It's just that your nervous system has over overridden that. So I already mentioned that it has the ability to override any endocrine control at any time. Um, when we talk about hormones, some hormones, when you release them, their response is immediate. Some hormones it takes a little bit, and some hormones it takes a lot, a long bit. For example, oxytocin, which is the hormone that triggers the uh, labor and delivery contractions, the contraction of the uterus, you start releasing oxytocin three weeks on average before you actually have the baby. So you can have contractions and you can be in labor for days before the baby's actually born. Braxton Hicks contractions are just a release of that oxytocin, just a surge of it. <clears throat> and we're going to cover that. We're going to that's going to be our last unit that we cover in O2. But those like contractions can last for a really long time. But if I'm going to release epinephrine, that has an immediate effect. Does that make sense? And if I'm going to break down my bone, that's kind of an intermediate effect. So I have to send that signal. It has to break down my bone. Like that's a process. So it just depends on what it is that you're doing um, and, and how long it lasts. So if it's something really quick, it usually ends quickly. If it's something really long, it usually takes a long time to end. For example, women will have babies. After they deliver a baby, they'll have contractions up to six weeks after, especially if they're nursing. So it's just because those hormone levels, not the same intensity. Okay, so if you haven't had kids and you're like, oh my God, I'm not going to have kids. Not the same intensity, but it actually helps to shrink your uterus. Because your uterus, you know, got really huge because you had that baby. And since the baby's not there, it's going to continue to contract. And because there's nothing there, it begins to atrophy. Your uterus is supposed to be half the size of your fist. So it expanded for you to have that baby. You need it to get back small again. Because if it stays big, you still look pregnant. And so we, we do have that, especially when people have babies back to back. Because their uterus doesn't remember their original size. It remembers their size that it was right before they got pregnant for the second time. Wait. <laughs> All right, and the duration um, of the, the hormonal impact, it just depends. It may last a few seconds, and it may last for weeks. 
So it just depends on what hormone and what its impact is and how much there is in your body. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go through each endocrine gland and talk about each hormone associated with it. So that's the way the rest of this chapter is broken down for the rest of the way. So the uh, pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is called the hypophysis. Those are the same thing, one and the same. There are two lobes, the posterior lobe and the anterior lobe. The posterior lobe releases two, the anterior lobe releases six hormones, okay? Um, it mentions here that the posterior lobe is neural tissue, so this is straight nervous tissue. This is glandular tissue, so this is endocrine tissue. When we talk about the posterior pituitary gland, there's only two hormones that the posterior pituitary gland releases. Oxytocin, which is what allows for um, labor contractions of the uterus, and ADH, which is the acronym for antidiuretic hormone, which regulates the blood volume, your blood volume. ADH, if you need, if your blood is getting too thick, you need to retain water. It'll release ADH so that you don't pee and you retain water. If you have too much water, you're not releasing ADH, so you're peeing a whole lot. So anytime ADH is being released, you're not peeing. Okay, um, except for if you're under the influence of alcohol. Alcohol inhibits ADH release, so you'll pee even if you're dehydrated. And then you'll get super dehydrated because you were drinking alcohol, and the next day you'll feel horrible because you're dehydrated. But that's antidiuretic that hormone that's responsible for that. So again, you have your hypothalamus. Here's your pituitary. This is the posterior. This is the anterior. The posteri posterior is referenced as neural tissue. So it's the neural tissue lobe. And you can clearly see that there's yellow here. We see yellow as being the nervous tissue. So it's under neural control. Again, oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone are released from the posterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary is glandular tissue, so it's endocrine. And it is just, it mentions that it's an outpocketing of oral mucosa that just tells you it's epithelial, which is <coughs> glandular. Okay? It has vascular connections there, so it's telling you that, hey, we have vessels here. So once those hormones are released, those hormones go directly into the blood. You do not see the nerves extending into the anterior pituitary. The hormones associated with the anterior pituitary. Growth hormone, prolactin, so PRL is prolactin. Um, LH is luteinizing hormone. FSH is follicle stimulating, and we're gonna go through each of these. Follicle stimulating hormone, ACTH is adrenal corticotropic hormone. TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. And GH is growth hormone. So six from the front, the anterior, two from the posterior. Eight total from the pituitary. Eight total hormones. Okay, now also on this diagram I want to point out we have the releasing hormones that are released in the hypothalamus. So GHRH, growth hormone releasing hormone. When growth hormone releasing hormone is released here, it sends a message here to release growth hormone. So releasing and then growth hormone is released. GHIH, what is that? Yes, so growth hormone inhibiting hormone when that is being released, guess what's not being released from the pituitary gland? Growth hormone. TRH is thyroid releasing hormone. So when that's being released, thyroid hormone is being released. Well, it's thyroid stimulating hormone will be released. CRH is corticotropic releasing hormone. When this is released from here, this is released from here, ACTH. GNRH. GN stands for gonadotropin releasing hormone. GNIH is gonadotropin inhibiting hormone. What are the gonads again? Ovaries. Ovaries and testes. Yes, ovaries and testes. So when uh, GNRH or growth or gonadotropin releasing hormone is released, we have follicle stimulating and luteinizing hormone. These are our gonadotropin. Okay, follicle stimulating is going to make either sperm or egg. 
Luteinizing is going to make either testosterone or estrogen. So those are the hormones that go along with that. PIH is prolactin inhibiting hormone. Prolactin is the hormone that allows you to produce and release milk. So if you're not producing and releasing milk in your mammary glands, it's because you're releasing PIH. So it's saying don't do it. But when oxytocin levels are high because you're having uterine contractions, it stimulates the release of prolactin. So that after you have those uterine contractions, that you will then begin to produce and release milk. Okay? Um, and both men and women are uh, subject to the impacts of prolactin. It's just that men don't release PIH. But if you inject a man with prolactin, his mammary glands will, I mean, they're already developed, they're already there, but they will fill with milk and he will produce and release milk, just like a woman. So um, it's awkward, it'd be a horrible joke, but it is something that is definitely, it, it does happen. Is it harmful? It is not harmful. Men, you see this. <laughs> yeah, it, there's a lot of like the gender stuff that you can, you can buy the hormone, and um, it's actually, there's, you could just YouTube it. I didn't know that you could YouTube it until I taught high school. <laughs> the more you know. And now, like, my high school students teach me how to backdoor everything. Like, if I've ever had a question, if I've ever had a random question that came from a high school student, <laughs> I'm like, ooh, never thought about that. And so you can pretty much YouTube anything. But yes, there are quite a few men who actually like to produce uh, no, oh. and you can actually make, as a female, you can sell your milk, your breast milk, to a milk bank and, and make a whole lot of money. Because women who are wealthy and don't want to actually have the kid, they'll pay a surrogate mother and then they'll buy milk from a milk bank. So, um, and some women, just when they're, they have their baby and they're producing milk, they produce way more milk than their baby will consume, so you just freeze it and sell it to a milk bank. It's a business, mm. like a business business. All right, I can like fill you in with all of that stuff because I did start asking my high school students started asking questions, and I was like, let me figure it out, and I did, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is a whole underworld. Yeah, <laughs> it's awkward, but it's a thing. Oxytocin and ADH. Oxytocin and ADH are released by the posterior. Um, pituitary, oxytocin, so we're going to go into each one. Um, oxytocin is the hormone that stimulates the uterine contractions used to e e finally eject a baby, um, and we will call it eject. I know that that sounds crazy, but that's what it's referenced in, especially when we get to that chapter. So yeah, the baby is ejected. Um, whenever you release oxytocin, it's based on positive feedback. Everything else we're going to talk about is negative feedback, but positive feedback means I'll release it. And it'll send a message, hey, contract to get rid of the baby. The uterus will contract, but the baby doesn't come out. So the, a message is sent back to the brain that says, hey, the baby didn't come out. And the brain says, okay, more power. And so it releases more oxytocin. And so then maybe four or five hours later, we get a stronger contraction. When that stronger contraction comes on, the baby's not released. It goes back to the brain. Baby's still not out. More power. So before a woman has a baby, her contractions are usually a minute or two apart because her blood levels of oxytocin are so crazy high. But when she initially starts having contractions, like it's not like you see in the movies where they have one contraction and all of a sudden it's like, oh, the baby's out. It's not like that. Because the blood levels of oxytocin are so low initially, it may take weeks of contractions before the baby actually is ejected or expelled from the body. So um, that's the thing. The release of oxytocin will then trigger the release of prolactin. So that will allow for the milk to be produced and eventually ejected as well. And if it's your first child, this is normally a, a longer process. If it's your second, third child, you could even start producing and releasing milk before you've delivered because your body already um, has built a tolerance to those hormones. So that's definitely not uncommon for women to be like, oh my gosh, I'm already releasing milk, and they don't even have a baby. So, um, well, I mean, they have had one, but the, they're still pregnant with the other one. 
Ultimately, um, it's the brain that's controlling the release of this oxytocin, and the oxytocin in the due date of the child is de determined by the child itself. So the due date that is given to you by the doctor is just an estimate, but the baby itself will produce a, a material in their lungs, when their lungs are mature, that tells the mother's body that they're ready to be born. So a baby can't be born until naturally until its lungs are ready. And if it's born premature, it's because the lungs aren't ready, and that's why they have to be in the NICU for a long time. The last organs to develop are the lungs. ADH is antidiuretic hormone, also called vasopressin. This inhibits urine production. So if you're releasing ADH, you are not peeing. The only reason you would not pee is because you are dehydrated. Okay, so your water levels are low. Your body has been told, to, is, your brain is now telling your kidneys, do not let them pee. Keep all of that water inside. And you won't pee. And if you do pee, it will be small amounts of pee and it will be a dark color because there's not a high water content because the water is being retained by your body. So that's also an indication that you have a patient who's dehydrated if their pee is a dark color. Okay, again, uh, it helps our kidneys to resorb more water. It's inhibited by alcohol. So if you're drinking alcohol, you will not release ADH. And so you're gonna constantly pee, but alcohol actually dehydrates your cells. So you pee a whole lot when you're drinking, and then the next morning you're really dehydrated, which gives you that hangover effect. And the only reason you're hungover is because you're dehydrated. So you drinking a lot of water will help overcome that. ADH, um, issues with ADH. Diabetes and septicemia, and we're gonna talk about that at the end when we talk about homeostatic imbalances. But people with diabetes, um, they tend to undergo what we call polyuria, which means that they pee a whole lot. And because they're peeing a whole lot, they're not retaining any water, so they tend to be dehydrated. So they're also suffering from polydipsia, which means they're super thirsty. So it's really just important that people with diabetes and insipidus are constantly drinking because they're peeing so much. The syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone release, which is actually a syndrome, means that you're constantly releasing ADH and you're retaining water, right? But you don't necessarily have to retain water. You're not dehydrated. So that's a problem and it can cause swelling and edema and so on. So um, issues with how much water you would intake would be a thing and how much sodium. So sodium, a diet low on sodium would be necessary to treat this individual. Okay, anterior pituitary hormones. We're gonna go through each of these. So they're listed here and you can see the acronyms for each as well. So if you didn't get them when I went over them just a little bit ago. And there they are. Anterior pituitary hormones are all protein-based or amino acid-based, so that means that they cannot get into the cell, okay? It says that they have to have a second messenger. A second messenger is a fancy way of saying they cannot get into the cell. So for example, if I need to get a message, if this is the cell membrane, if I need to get a message and I'm a protein-based hormone, I can't get in, but I can get to right here. And then I can say, could you please tell this and, and so you would be the second messenger because I can't get into that cell. Okay, starting off with growth hormone. Growth hormone um, directs the metabolism of your bones and muscles. It does affect a lot of other cells as well, but the primary targets are going to be with the most receptors are going to be your bone muscle. Of course, that's going to help you grow. We're also going to notice that when people are going through growth spurts, their diet, their cravings for food increase, so they eat a lot more food because their glucose levels, that there's an increase in glucose needed so that they have more energy in order to grow. So when people are hitting growth spurts, you see that they eat a lot as well, and that correlates with the fact that they need more glucose. Um, it mentions here the indirect effects, of course, growth hormone is gonna cause you to grow in size, but indirect effects is that it causes your bones, the, the uh, integrity of your bones to increase. We want to see thicker, healthier, stronger bones. Um, of course, you're growing this size too, but we want appositional growth. We want them to be healthy, nice bones. Their main target, again, is the skeletal and the bone, bone and skeletal muscle. Um, when do we know to release growth hormone? When growth hormone releasing hormone is released from the hypothalamus. When our brain says it's time to grow, it's time to grow. When our brain says it's not time to grow, inhibiting hormone will be released. Ghrelin is a your hunger hormone. We tend to see that right before a growth spurt, individuals who are about to hit a growth spurt get super hungry and it's because the hormone, hunger hormone ghrelin is being released in order to prepare glucose levels for this growth spurt that's about to occur, okay?
you can't be 29 years old and say I'm about to hit a growth spurt. That's why I'm eating so much because that's not going to happen. You're done. Okay, but if you if you have a four or five year old kid and they're all of a sudden you know went from eating just a muffin once a day to eating a whole bunch, it's probably because their body is sending messages that that they need to increase their glucose levels. Okay, when you have growth hormone. Of course, we want it released in homeostatic amounts, but there's hypersecretion. What does hypersecretion tell you? It's too much growth hormone. So if it's hypersecretion, too much growth hormone is being released, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to get big. I, I, we're just going to use logic there. They're going to be really big. Okay? If, if they're children and growth hormone is released at crazy amounts, it causes them to be really, really big. If they're adults and for whatever reason growth hormone is continuously released, they don't get bigger, their bones get thicker. Like they, it's what we call acromegaly. Um, and so their eyes kind of start to bulge out, their face kind of becomes a little bit more square shaped. So it's just, they just become like a, a boxier type person. Okay, what is hyposecretion? Too low. Growth hormone levels are too low, so I have tiny, tiny little kids. So they're dwarfs. Okay. Um, and this is telling you kind of a flow chart for how growth hormone impacts not just bones, but other aspects and um, metabolic aspects as well. Okay. Um, when you look at this picture, I still, and, okay, so obviously he's really big and he's really small, but look at her compared to the roof. So is she average or not? Like, I feel like she's also very big. Like yeah, okay, yeah. So, I don't know, like, at first I was like, okay, that's an average size person, but that, I, I believe that she is not average size. No, they look like a 12 size shoe. Okay, just looking at her feet, I like her too. So, every time I look at this, I'm like, oh, I don't, I can't really tell. But, obviously, you have the two extremes, and I still think that she would be on, on a spectrum of extreme. So, she's definitely a taller woman. Okay. Thyroid stimulating hormone, so TSH. Thyroid stimulating hormone, the purpose of thyroid stimulating hormone is to stimulate the release of thyroid hormone from the thyroid, and that's why you would release it. Thyroid hormone is a metabolic hormone, so it impacts pretty much every cell in your body because every cell has its own metabolism, okay? And so normal growth. If your thyroid hormone levels are homeostatic, if you have plenty of thyroid hormone, you send a message back to your brain that says, hey, I'm good, and guess what you stop releasing? Thyroid hormone. It revolves on a negative feedback, where oxytocin was positive feedback, so it got worse and worse until something stopped it. Everything else rolls on negative feedback, which means once you've done what I've asked you to do, I don't need you to do anything else. We're good. And when I need you again, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you I need some more thyroid hormone. Okay, so it mentions that as well. Here's this cycle, and it comes up again later on in the notes. But my hypothalamus, in order for thyroid hormone to be released, my hypothalamus has to release thyroid-releasing hormone. When thyroid-releasing hormone is released from my hypothalamus, it will tell my anterior pituitary to release thyroid-stimulating hormone. When thyroid-stimulating hormone is released, guess what my thyroid will do? It will release thyroid hormone. And then thyroid hormones will be released in my blood, and when those levels are homeostatic, a message will be sent back that says, hey, we're good. And then it will stop. And when I need it again, it'll start over. It's a cascading event. It's not just all of a sudden do I release all this hormone. A, a, a series of reactions have to take place, or actions. Okay, adrenal corticotropic hormone, which is ACTH. Adrenal tells you it's affecting your adrenal glands, which are on top of your kidneys. Corticotropic tells me that it's dealing with the cortex. So it's using the, cor the cortex of any organ is the outer few millimeters. Okay, So the adrenal cortex is the outer part. This is not epinephrine or norepinephrine. This is not fight or flight. This is on the outside of my adrenal gland. Okay, The outside of my adrenal gland. There's a, quite a few things that can be impacted by the outside of my adrenal gland, my adrenal cortex. So we're going to look at that. And it, it's mentioning adrenal corticotropic might also be called corticotropin. I didn't mention that on the previous slide, but it was also there because I kept it kind of uniform. You should be releasing this kind of once you, you should have a system 
to where you're kind of maintaining homeostasis. For males, it's more balanced than it is for females because females have hormonal fluctuations every single month. Once they hit puberty until they pass menopause. And then all of a sudden, it's crazy. But once men hit puberty, they have a fluctuation for about three years and then they plateau for the rest of their lives. Okay, so for females, it's a little different, which is why they're like, girls are crazy. But that's what that is, okay? So we might see some fluctuation, but ultimately it mentions there's a daily rhythm to it, okay? And it also may cause you to undergo fever or you might release cort uh, corticotropic hormones whenever you're under extreme amounts of stress. And we notice that when mothers who are stressed a lot, whether it's financially or they're not eating right, their babies are impacted and have a high sensitivity to stress later on in life as well. But we'll talk about that when we get to development. Gonadotropins. Gonadotropins are produced by your gonads, which are your ovaries if you're female and your testes if you're a male. Okay, so there's two gonadotropins, follicle stimulating and luteinizing. Follicle stimulating tells you to produce the follicle. The male follicle is a sperm, the female follicle is an egg. If you're releasing follicle stimulating hormone, you're releasing or your, your sperm or egg are reacting to that. Males will continue to release follicle stimulating hormone constantly once they hit puberty. Once they hit puberty is when they start making sperm and they do not stop until they die. Women make all of their eggs before they're even born. So you're born with all of your eggs. But each month when you ovulate, once you hit puberty, you'll have a little surge of follicle stimulating hormone that'll tell that follicle, hey, it's your turn. It's your turn to have a chance to be fertilized, okay? So you're born with all your eggs if you're a female, and if you're a male, and once you run out of eggs is when you hit menopause if you're a female. And when you're a male, once you hit puberty, you never stop making sperm until you die. Luteinizing hormone is what makes the boys, boys, and girls, girls. So luteinizing is for testosterone if you're a boy and for estrogens and progesterone if you're a girl, okay? And um, if you are, haven't hit puberty, we're not gonna see either one of those being released. Once you hit puberty, there's gonna be a surge in both of those hormones, all right? So you don't see those in younger kids. What triggers the release of gonadotropins? Gonadotropin releasing hormone, GNRH, and that's made in the hypothalamus. So when GNRH is released, that's when you start to release your gonadotropins, okay? Prolactin is um, also anterior pituitary and it's secreted. It tells your mammary glands to go ahead and uh, begin to produce and store milk so that you can feed a child. They are um, basically, not basically, they are random negative feedback. So when a child nurses off of a mother and her mammary glands are depleted of the milk, a signal is sent back to her brain that says, hey, you're out of milk. And so she'll have a surge of prolactin that will cause her to produce more milk. And as long as the baby is cycling and suckling, she will continue to produce milk. When the baby stops, she'll slowly stop. It will not be an immediate thing. So when women kind of wean their babies off of breastfeeding, it can be really painful for her because she'll continue to produce milk and the baby's not releasing that. So there's a lot of pressure there. Prolactin in males, even though they have it, it's not very active. Of course, I already mentioned it could be. But that's it. It can progress, or just the, it won't have what a baby needs, right? Yeah. It, it, it will have all the. It is that how it's going to make them breastfeed? Is that, is that like attractive, though? I would think not. <laughs> I think that would be the <laughs> most unattractive thing ever. I think it would be too convenient, though. See what? I think it'd be if I would have known that, I would have made my husband do it. Okay. I think it was gross to me. Yeah, I. I don't, I would know, I, don't, I would not ask my husband to do it. I would, I would, I would tell him. Because I really she, wanted my kids to be, but it's just. Breastfed, yeah. No, 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 yeah. I understand that aspect. Um, yeah, and, and technically we already know that as a couple, and once you have a child, you don't sleep for six years. Like, you don't get a sleep pattern until that child was six. Oh my God. Did you share six? I think it's longer than Okay, no, no, no. 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 <laughs> to where you can actually cycle through your sleep stages the way you're supposed to, it's six. Now, whether you get the amount of sleep that you need, it's six years. So, uh, yeah. I won't have any more kids. My boy's nine. I had to I'm like, with Mary no. like four days ago just to stay awake sharing. <laughs> hey, but that's not just you. That's everybody. Is it really? Oh, yeah. In the middle of the day? Girl, I, no disrespect, <laughs> yeah. but a lot of y'all fall asleep. Yeah. 
<laughs> and, and it's not, and there, and then I get usually emails like, I didn't mean to be disrespectful. You're not disrespectful. I'm here thinking, man, you're I'm clearly stressed and you're going off low levels of sleep. But at, no, but at night, I'm wide awake. Yeah. It's just during you're the just, days. But that's chronic stress. You're worried about what else you have to do. <laughs> that's true. Put it on a checklist. All right. Um, so I already mentioned that this is uh, based on negative feedback. So the baby suckles and it causes you to release more milk. Hypersecretion. So some women release a whole lot of prolactin, so she produces way more milk than she needs. Money maker if you're going to study breast milk. Okay. Otherwise, it's completely inconvenient. More money for the babies. Okay. Okay. Oh, but still, if we have prolactin released in males, it can lead to infertility and impotence, which is the inability to maintain an erection. So do you really want your husband to breastfeed? No. I would think not. No. Yeah, not me neither. Okay, so uh, it was a good conversation. I'm glad we addressed it. it was. So now it's we... over. <laughs> well, I will take those I will take those awkward moments and I'll like explain them and then you'll be like, oh. Yeah, no. So never mind. Yeah. No. Okay, no. It might be a convenience factor for a moment, but then you would be tired of it. Okay, so thyroid gland produces the thyroid hormone. The, initially, what this is discussing right here is its anatomy. It also mentions the parafollicular cells. Thyroid, <coughs> then the parafollicular cells produce the hormone calcitonin. We're not talking about the parathyroid <coughs> gland. We're talking about parafollicular cells, so don't get those two mixed up. Calcitonin and parathyroid hormone are actually antagonistic to one another. Calcitonin decreases calcium levels in the blood. Parathyroid hormone increases the calcium levels in the blood. So here's the thyroid. It's called the butter shape, or butter shape, butterfly shaped gland. This middle part right here is the isthmus. It connects the two lobes. The posterior view is where the um, parathyroid glands are. It mentions here that the thyroid hormone basically affects every cell in the body. Your thyroid hormones basically affect every cell in the body. So it talks about different derivatives of thyroid hormone, which you won't have to know, but pretty much anything that has a metabolic function, thyroid hormone impacts. Uh, it is a major metabolic hormone. I clearly just says that, and I said that as well. Um, any type of development, regulation, uh, development, maintenance, that's all based on thyroid hormone. We see thyroid hormones, we see thyroids being very large in children, and as you age, they tend to get smaller, especially if you stay in the same area your whole life. If you move around, your thyroid hormone or your thyroid tends to stay a little bit larger as your body starts to learn different areas. Um, but once you're in the same spa spot for multiple years in a row, that thyroid begins to atrophy, and so we see people suffering from thyroid issues. Exercise, multivitamin, well, take care of yourself while you're young, and then you won't have to do it and it's as intensely when you get older. You'll be this healthy older person that's walking around your neighborhood doing you, loving life and your grandkids, and not medicated up on four different, 12 different medications that you have to take daily. Um, thyroid hormone rolls on a negative feedback. So this was literally the um, hormone that we used on the, I think it's right here, yeah, same thing. Negative feedback means that it tells you to release it. Whenever you have enough of it, it tells you to stop releasing it. Does everybody understand what negative feedback means? Like you have a problem, you fix it, and then it's done. And then when you have the problem again, you function to fix it. Positive feedback says you start the problem and it gets worse, 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 worse until something physically stops it. And that's the having the baby one. Everything else rolls on negative feedback. Okay. Um, homeostatic imbalances of thyroid hormone. So hyposecretion means that you don't release enough of it. So you might have a goiter or myxedema. Goiters are usually used in uh, populations of malnourishment. So they kind of grow very large as a, a result of a lack of iodine. If your goiter starts to form, you can have iodine supplements and it goes away. But once it stretches and damages that tissue, even if you do become uh, homeostatic iodine-wise, you still have <coughs> that crazy growth. Hyposecretion in infants leads to cretinism. Cretinism is where you're a tiny, like, pixie-like kid. Small, small, small. Hypersecretion is Graves' disease. Graves' disease, I think I have a picture. Yeah. Okay, so here's a goiter right here. It's kind of hard to see this poor kiddo right there, but it's just like this big, large lump um, there. And it's not a tumor. It's just a, gr a growth as a result of a lack of iodine, and that tissue is damaged beyond its ability to repair. Graves' disease is where, so thyroid hormone is being released a whole lot. You can see that her eyes are literally bulging.
bulging. And I'm assuming that this is a girl. It may be a man. I don't know. But it, you, we call them a bug eye effect. Like they're, because it just starts to stick out. We also notice that the bones become more pronounced and boxy too in their face. So Graves disease um, as a result of thyroid hormone. Just bulging eyes. And that kind of jaundice looking color to them. Calcitonin. I already mentioned that um, parathyroid hormone increases calcium levels in your blood. Calcitonin decreases. So if you have calcium in your blood, calcitonin will come and store it in your bones. So that, because you, that your body knows you're going to need it. Okay? Any excess calcium that's ridiculously too much that your body can't use, which it takes a lot to be that way, can eventually form kidney stones, calcium <coughs> deposits, and so on later on. Okay? But ultimately, um, what calcitonin does is it helps you to retain calcium. Parathyroid hormone breaks down your bone to release calcium. Okay, so they're antagonistic to one another. So here is parathyroid hormone once again. Parathyroid hormone will break down your bone and increase blood calcium levels. Calcitonin decreases blood calcium levels. Okay, here are your parathyroid glands. So your thyroid was that butter shape, butterfly shaped gland. Here's the back of it, the posterior or dorsal view. Functions of parathyroid hormone once again. Okay. What if you have too much parathyroid hormone release? Hyperparathyroidism. Tell me what the impact would be, logically speaking. Too much parathyroid hormone released. What does parathyroid hormone do? Break down your bone. So tell me what's going to happen to a patient who has too much. They're going to have brittle, weak bones. Yes. Okay, calcium levels are going to be really high in their blood. Increase in parathyroid, or, uh, parathyroid hormone. Because calcium levels are so high, their body's trying to get rid of all that calcium. We start to see kidney stones, issues like that. Okay, why would you have hypoparathyroidism? Be parathyroidism? Because you probably have a tumor that's there. And it probably it may not even be cancerous. It's probably benign. It's just causing you to release more than you need to. Hypo would be the exact opposite. The problem with being hypoparathyroid or suffering from hypoparathyroidism is that when your blood calcium levels are low, you don't break down the bone like you're supposed to. So calcium levels decrease, your nervous system suffers, and your muscular system suffers. Two systems that totally need calcium in order to work. So we start to see um, tetany, which is like a, a continuous muscle contraction, um, cramps, but not like, oh, I have a muscle cramp. No, I have. Okay, that's not that, so don't flip out on me on that. Um, but respiratory paralysis, especially whenever it talks about the diaphragm. And when the diaphragm is paralyzed, guess what happens? You can't breathe. Yeah, you can't breathe. You suffocate. You die. Okay. Expire. Adrenal glands. Two parts to the adrenal. So again, we're on top. Renal tells us it's kidney. Adrenal tells us it's on top of the kidney. Two parts. There's the cortex and the medulla. The cortex is the adrenal cortex, the outside. The medulla is the part in the middle. The medulla is going to release epinephrine, norepinephrine. The cortex is going to release three different things. Okay, so that's what this is going to tell you. Three parts of the cortex. The zona is just the level. So glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis. These all sound like Starbucks drinks to me. But mineral corticoids, glucocorticoids, and gonadocorticoids. What do you think a glucocorticoid helps you do? Glucose. Something with glucose. All I'm asking is for logic, and you can start to figure out all of these diseases, I'm telling you. You start to think, and there's really nothing you can't do. Gennato? Something with your gonads. What about minerals? Minerals. Yes, yeah, something with minerals. Okay? And literally, if you can think like that, you can answer a whole bunch of questions. So this is showing you a cross-section of the adrenal gland. So as you get into the medulla, that's where our blood vessels are going to be. So this is where epinephrine is. And norepinephrine, that's where all this will be released. But here are the three levels. So the reticularis, reticular means deeper, okay? Fasciculata, and then the glomerulosa. So the three levels, and it tells you what hormones are released in those areas. We're going to discuss them briefly. Mineral corticoids help you regulate electrolyte levels. Sodium, potassium, um, really important electrolytes that you need for muscles and for nervous system stimulation. It mentions ECF, remember that that's extracellular fluid, so it, it uses chemoreceptors to respond to that. Okay, so mineral corticoids help to regulate electrolyte levels. 
This gives you an example of an in a, a homeostatic imbalance of a mineral corticoid aldosteronism. If you have a tumor on any gland, it oversecretes whatever hormone that is. If you're oversecreting electrolytes, we have an issue. Too much sodium can cause cramping, too much potassium can cause issues, so we, we're going to have an issue. Overall, and it mentions here, of course, cramping muscles. And what leads to muscle cramping? The nervous system. So these two, we call it a neuromuscular junction. That was in O1 as well. And they would work together. That's going to be an issue. Glucocorticoids, as you mentioned, has something to do with glucose. When you're stressed, you release levels of higher levels of glucose. That's your body's way of coping. It says, oh, we're in a stressful situation. We need more energy. Here's more glucose. So glucocorticoids are responsible for stressful situations increasing glucose levels. It also uses the term here, gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis means that your body doesn't just take carbohydrates to get sugar. It can take any molecule in your body, including fats or proteins, and use them to make sugar in a stressful situation. So why, why people can go a long time without uh, eating, they still need the water to keep their electrolyte levels homeostatic and the electricity transmitting so they don't dehydrate. But your body can take adipose and turn that into sugar and use that for energy. So gluconeogenesis is the ability for your body to take something that's not carbohydrate and turn it into carbohydrate. Okay, and of course, that would be the pur purpose of the um, glucocorticoids. Too many glucocorticoids can lead to Cushing syndrome, and here are the uh, conditions, because I know we're running lower on time. The um, situations or symptoms that are associated with Cushing syndrome. Um, hyposecretion can lead to Addison's disease. Addison's disease is usually, um, when we say somebody has, uh, not Addison's, uh, Cushing syndrome, here she's super healthy, and then here she starts to get sick. She gets this little buffalo hump, and um, that is a same lady. Same lady. Same lady. Stressful situation, increased levels of uh, glucocorticoids, so she's producing way too much glucose and um, not needing it. So we start, when your body has too much sugar, it will store this fat. So it's turning things that are not sugar into sugar and then storing it as fat. Not a good thing. But it's that little fat pad on her back that helps to, uh, to diagnose that. Gonadocorticoids are making your gonads. Um, or not your gonads, your, the gonadotropic hormones. So what we see is normally these are the hormones that are used to, to tell us it's time to hit puberty. So it kind of cycles through. And also it tells you here that it can um, lead to the onset of puberty. I said that secondary sexual characteristics, body hair, masculinization, and so on. Sex drive in women, but not men, that's a different setup. And then estrogen levels in postmenopausal women, which we'll also get back to. Too much gonadotropins being released. Too much gonadotropins are being released in males, we really don't know that. You don't really say, you're a really masculine male, because they're just males, so they just have that masculinity to them. But if you're a female and you release too many gonadotropins, you actually start to become male-looking. So you start to develop like facial hair, and you, you look more like a man than a, a woman. So that's an issue. Uh, so it mentions where we can kind of see there. Uh, for boys, you know, they may mature a little bit earlier, but you never say, oh, he has a hypersecretion hyper of male hormones because he's just a boy. So you don't know that. Adrenal medulla, the medulla is responsible for the um, epinephrine and norepinephrine. So the effects of epinephrine and norepinephrine, vasoconstriction, increased heart rate. So this is your fight or flight, increased blood glucose levels because you're scared and all your blood is shunted to your vital organs and not so much your skeletal or uh, familicular organs. Uh, structures. Um, the responses of epinephrine and norepinephrine are very quick but brief. However, if you're scared, you can't just go back to being relaxed five minutes later. Like it takes your body some time to kind of cycle, cycle through that. So it mentions that here. Too much uh, uh, release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. That causes you to be kind of high strung. It mentions that here. Um, hypertension, palpitations, like you have an abnormal heart rate, intense nervousness, sweating. Too little, not a real big deal. You're just a pretty lax person. So nobody ever says, oh, you don't uh, release enough epinephrine or norepinephrine. The penile gland, another endocrine organ, releases uh, melatonin. So your sleep and wake cycle, your circadian rhythm is regulated by a release from your penile gland, which is in your epithalamus. Still, this is behind your hypothalamus. And um, this could also lead to when you hit puberty, 
but mostly this cycles through your circadian rhythm. You can manipulate that. It takes 21 days to manipulate your sleep and wake cycle. So being in a pattern for a certain set time will help you establish your circadian rhythm. The pancreas has endocrine and exocrine functions. Its exocrine functions are digestion. So when it releases specifically into a duct, that's digestion. But we're in the endocrine system, so we're looking at insulin and glucagon. Insulin decreases blood glucose levels. Glucagon increases blood glucose levels. So um, I'll mention that here. So your alpha and beta pancreatic cells tell you whether they produce insulin or glucagon. Insulin decreases blood glucose. Glucagon increases blood glucose. Glucagon is responsible for taking, uh, first of all, do you remember what gluconeogenesis is again? We just saw this term. Gluco tells you sugar, neo the beginning, and genesis the creation of. So gluconeogenesis tells you I will take things that are not carbohydrates and turn them into carbohydrates. Glycogenolysis. Glycogenolysis is where your body will take glycogen that you stored, so a lot of sugar you stored in your liver, and break it down. This it does whenever you starve yourself or you skip meals, and this is what happens. Your body goes into a, a, a situation where glycogenolysis takes place, and that's because of the hormone glucagon released by the pancreas. So this breaks down uh, glycogen into glucose, and this creates glucose from things that are not carbohydrates, like fats or proteins. <coughs> Insulin, its goal is to lower blood glucose levels, so whenever you're releasing insulin, your cells are being told it's time to eat, so they take in all the glucose from your blood so it lowers your blood sugar. That's what we want to happen. If you don't have insulin, then the blood sugar stays in your blood. It doesn't get into your cells. So your cells are hungry. It causes you to overeat. And that's what we see with diabetics. So diabetics who are insulin dependent have to inject themselves with insulin so it tells their cells to take the sugar out of their blood and use it in, the, in themselves for their individual metabolism. And it's showing you here this is a negative feedback mechanism this was used, this is the same diagram in 01. Factors that increase how much insulin you release, how, much, how often you eat, what you eat. If your food has a whole lot of sugar, then we're, we're, gonna, we're supposed to release more insulin, but what if you eat a whole lot of sugar a whole lot of the time, your body becomes overwhelmed, and you can actually be led to a di diet-dependent diabetes where you don't necessarily need insulin, but you just need to control what it is that you eat. If your muscles are working a whole lot, you have this need for glucose. Why would your muscles be working a lot? You're probably doing something that you don't normally do. You're like working out, you're doing something that's more physically tasking, so your, your muscles are gonna be hungry. Insulin, so you're gonna eat more, so insulin levels should increase. And um, it, it talks about how you would handle all of that here, but ultimately, you would have more insulin if you're trying to get rid of more glucose, um, because you're eating more. Diabetes insipidus was mentioned earlier, but diabetes mellitus, another form of diabetes. We know that an individual <coughs> keys to patients having diabetes, glycosuria. Glycosuria means that you have sugar in your pee. So they do a pee test, and if, a lot of times they say, it kind of smells sweet. Your pee smells sweet. I've never smelled my pee. I don't plan on smelling my pee, but I bet if you have diabetes and this is a thing, you have sweet-smelling pee. I've never smelled a sweet-smelling pee. I don't want to smell a sweet smelling pee. Okay, but that is an indication. Um, if we start to use lipids for fuel, that's an issue, we, and this can lead to ketoacidosis, and ketoacidosis could lead to a comatose, which could kill that individual with diabetes. Um, and it mentions that here, coma, and then death possible. So you wanna make sure if you have diabetes, you're taking care of yourself and eating a healthy diet, which a lot of people don't. And signs that you have diabetes, polyuria, which means you pee a lot, Polydipsia, which means you're really thirsty because you pee a lot. And polyphagia, which means you're crazy hungry. And that's because your cells are starved. Not because you need the food, but because you've starved your cells, you need insulin. Hyperinsulinism. This means you produce too much insulin. That means that your blood sugar is really low. And because your blood sugar is low, a lot of times we call these individuals hypoglycemic. When your blood sugar is low, guess what you do to fix that? You take some more sugar. Drink a Coke, eat a Snickers, do something like that, and you're just gonna be fine. Okay, so you treat that by sugar ingestion. So here is showing you some how diabetes works together. Ovaries and placenta. Ovaries produce the estrogen and progesterone. Placenta also produces fetal hormones. And oxytocin that will eventually lead to um, the onset of labor and delivery. 
Ovaries allow for the sec secondary sexual characteristics in females. Of course, men don't have ovaries. Men have testes, and they produce testosterone when luteinizing hormone is released, and this allows them to develop like boys. Okay, so if you put testosterone in a female, she'll develop like a male. If you put estrogen in a male, he'll develop like a female because we're both sensitive to those hormones. Other hormones, adipose releases leptin. Leptin is your hormone that says, hey, you're done eating. Don't eat anymore. Um, we see that the small percentage of our population suffers from the fact that they don't have leptin, so they never know when to stop eating. But this is also a psychological thing too, so it might not be a leptin um, issue. Resistant is an insulin antagonist, so it wants to keep blood sugar low or higher. And then adiponectin enhances your sensitivity to insulin, so you become more sensitive to insulin, so your body tries to take up more glucose. Those are all produced by the uh, fat cells. Indo enteroendocrine. This is of your just your GI tract. We're not going to go into each of these, but these are different hormones that are produced by your intestines. Gastrin secreting, uh, secretin, cholecystokinin, and serotonin. Ultimately, serotonin is the one that tells you, hey, this food makes you feel good, so eat it, but now you're good. That's why they tell you to wait about 15 minutes after you eat before you continue to eat, because you just need that time for the hormones to communicate and tell you you're good. Okay. Atrial natriuretic peptide is a hormone that is released and only affects your heart. So it's released, produced, released, and only impacts your heart. Atrial natriuretic peptide. Kidneys produce erythropoietin. Erythropoietin, we will study next week, is responsible for producing red blood cells. So um, your kidneys uh, tell you to produce more red blood cells. Renin is another hormone that we'll get to in a future chapter, but it has to do with your um, renin angiotensin <coughs> aldosterone and balance your homeostasis. Osteocalcin, guess what osteocalcin has an impact on? Bones. Okay, good. Your bones. Okay, and it mentions here it's activated by insulin, so whenever your insulin is telling you to go ahead and take that glucose in, osteocalcin, so it's going to help to make your bones stronger and keep the integrity of your bones high. Your skin responsible for colcalcitrol, which will eventually lead to vitamin D, so this is why they say you, when you're in the sun, it increases your levels of vitamin D, not directly, but indirectly. So skin exposure, 15 minutes, sun exposure, 15 minutes a day is all you need. You don't need anything more than that. The thymus, which is not the thyroid. So we have thyroid and then thymus. Thymus is different than the thyroid. The thymus is responsible for your T cells um, when we get to your immune system slash lymphatic system. Okay, so uh, it mentions the T cells there, the lymphocytes. Developmental aspects. You're going to be producing hormones throughout your life. There'll be times when there's surges and lows and high and all of that. Take care of yourself. Eat right. And uh, make sure you take a vitamin and take a shower. Ovaries, once... <laughs> it's going to be what I say all the time. Ovaries, once you hit menopause, the levels of your hormones drop. So you see that women, when they hit menopause, they go through these crazy fluctuations and then they're, they're crazy. And it's because they've had these hormones for about 20 years and now they have to learn to cope without them. We have hormonal replacement therapy. You can get patches, injections, or oral pills that will help to handle that. Okay, it doesn't happen with males because they continue to produce testosterone the rest of their life. Growth hormone, we see growth hormone surges throughout life in different points whenever you're hitting growth spurts. Okay, and endocrine is over. Happy first.